We acknowledge and give thanks for the land in which our church built its hands, its country, for which the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin Nation are the traditional custodians. We honour their elders past, present, and emerging, and commit ourselves to work for reconciliation and justice. And I just wondered if you ever noticed that on the entrance to the church, there is always uh, a, uh, a cross. And there are, we have two of the crosses. One is the one on the other one. The other one is there, and they have the indigenous um, theme of it's always reminded us that we are on the land that stands for silence. We're going to start with hymn number 672. And yes, again, you have no PowerPoint, so I'm using the hymn books just for the second week to so roll things back. And then, uh, it's called Lord of Earth and All Creation. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Of 
in parts it's painful, in parts it's raw. In others, it's beautiful, inspiring, great all. She tells of many people from far and wide, and words of beauty that exist at the beginning of the time. Brings us together, tears us apart. We all have our wounds. So, where do we start? By listening to each other and sharing our mind. We all part of the story. It sits now into the time where we spend some time in the association of people. These words have been inside for all years of work. And there's yours. When I say the words, God in whom we trust and hope, in your mercy, please respond in your prayer. Mm. You, O oh God, do place our trust. We must all bring our prayers for the world and for the church. Let us pray. We pray for peoples of the world, for all who experience the horrors of war, famine, or disease, for all who suffer the loss of freedom and dignity, for our sisters and brothers around the world suffering from COVID 19, and selves for their loved ones. For world leaders in these fragile times, Help us all to answer your call, to make the mind our way to salvation and greed, that they may proclaim the gospel to a broken world. God, in whom we trust and hope, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for us all, particularly today. We are the same peoples of this land. We acknowledge and lament the injustice and abuse of the first peoples of this land in the past and that this society is still ongoing. We acknowledge and lament the way in which the Christian Church is also often totally complicit in the process of taking the land, language, culture, Law and spirituality from our first peoples, but also actively involved in it. God of mercy, forgive us all our failings, past and present. Give us the grace to make a fresh start today. Help us answer your call to leave behind our ways of prejudice and intolerance. That we may pray the gospel to our broken world. God, in whom we trust our God, in your mercy, we pray. We pray for the church, its clergy and people, our minister, the one, and our community here in the Lord United Church, and all who minister in this place. The pastor asks you all to leave behind our arrogance and division. We may proclaim the gospel to our broken world. God in whom we trust and hope in your mercy. We pray for communities in which we live, our families and friends, and all who give us love and companionship. 
all of his work that sustains this community. We give thanks for the release of refugees and asylum seekers in the this week. I hope and can pray this can continue with ongoing support for them. I must to answer your call. Leave behind our ways of alienation and apathy that we may proclaim the gospel to a broken world. God in whom we trust and hope in your mercy. We pray for all who are in need, for those whose lives are full of grief, loneliness, or despair, for the disabled, the infirm, the sick, and the dying, and for all who care for them. Help us answer your call to leave behind our ways of selfishness and neglect, that we may proclaim the gospel to our broken world. God, in whom we trust and hope, in your mercy, in our name. We give you thanks for your faithful servants of every age, Andrew, Peter, James, and John, and for those in every generation who have followed you. Help us, like them, to answer your call to live the mind that separates us from you. May we may find new life in your eternal presence. God, in whom we trust and hope, new mercy. Yeah. Uh, uh. We're going to see it's hymn number 585. It's called I Heard the Voice of Jesus Saying. Today you will be doing your words because this is no PowerPoint. So if anyone has a lot of money, you can work. And don't lose the gun if you do the rest of the Thank you, Josh. <laughs>
this day. The first one is from Acts, and it's about the believers' form of community marked by great joy and generosity. And I was going to read that one. Thank you. You know, reading from the next chapter, this is 42 to 47. The next is, that they have three times and took in those words, to baptize and recite them. They will need to give some of the teaching of the apostles and the right to them, come over here, and the rest. Everyone was allowed, all those workers and signs that have seen the apostles. I know the believers are in the right of having everything in the public. And so the day that we go and we put their resources so that each person's name was made. They follow a daily discipline to person in the temple, followed by meals of love. Every year at celebration, it together with the Jordan and the first part. People in general like what they saw every day. They have to prove it's God and it goes to the same. This is the word of the Lord. Second Bible reading today is taken from Mark 2. Uh, verses 13 to 17. I'm uh, reading from the message. And it's titled The Tax Then Jesus went again to walk alongside the lake. Again, the crowd came to him, and he taught them. Strolling along, he saw Levi, son of Atheus, at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, Come along with me. Yeah. Later, Jesus and his disciples were at home having supper with a collection of disreputable guests. And unlikely as it seems, more than a few of them had become followers. The religion scholars and Pharisees saw him keep this kind of company and meeting to his disciples. Kind of examples this acting cozy with the mystics. Jesus overheard. Who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? I believe my children sin sick, not the spiritual fit. We're going to sing again. This time we need to him. Um, and I think it's exactly what's in the theme of the part of the beauty and how we see. And it's called Faith Will Not Go, the proper and then go. And it's number 691. And we'll stay seated for them, 691. That's Josh. Um. Oh, 
commentary this morning or today's readings in parts comes from Bill Leggett, who's a retired United Church minister, and also additional information from United Church resources. First, the commentary on the Acts reading. The book of Acts is also called the Acts of the Apostles, and it describes the early Christian church movement and their actions. The book is an example of the historical narrative genre and is written by the Greek apostle Luke. And in his second account, addresses a man named Theophilus. The previous verses of Acts detail the happenings of the disciples during the first Pentecost. First, the Spirit descends upon them as it was promised to them. Then Peter preaches a sermon which consists primarily of scriptural proofs. This fellowship of the believers devoted themselves to the teaching of apostles like Peter and began sharing all things they had, even selling their own possessions in order to provide funds for anyone who needed them. Investigating further the way in which the fellowship of the believers decided to give up their things to the good of the whole. I would like to understand the effect that we had on the society in which these believers lived. The first thing to notice in terms of the way in which disciples came is that they had devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. The Oxford Bible commentary points out here that three new elements emerge teaching, fellowship, and the tradition of the breaking of the bread. And it had now been added to bread that forms the backbone of this early church's regular activities. The second thing to notice is that all came upon every soul, as is written in the text, and they were enraptured and mystified by the power of the Spirit working within them. This brought them together spiritually and unified them. Their physical outworking of this was to share all things they had. But this is not being conducted out of a sense of duty or obligation. It's done rather with glad and generous hearts. The final verse of the scripture reading sums up the first stage of the church's early existence in an idyllic state. It is a paradise garden where praise and growth are both simultaneous. We believe the three key points in the giving of the early Christians are that it was spontaneous, it was voluntary, and it was only those believers who had that here. Luke does say that despite the believers' exclusive communal and tangible generosity, that society in which they live was affected by their new behaviour. Verse 47 confirms this, and the believers leave on good terms to the people in their society. But also shows that believers are not necessarily concerned about dealing with the needs of the people as a whole. Perhaps the people of Israel saw such good treatment of one another as witnessed in the early Christian community. They are attracted to their generosity, their love, and also their fear of the Lord. Moving on to a commentary on the Mark reading. Jesus showed us this morning that there may be our hearts are in a dangerous place and ultimately we miss Jesus is we miss who Jesus is and where Jesus came to. We maybe have no problem with it being that we have a sin nature that often comes to the surface, but maybe we think that we're we aren't that we aren't that bad. That this person over here is worse than us, maybe 
the equipment point out all the ways that everyone else needs to change, but we the problem. In the Mark text, it says that Jesus went out again inside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him. He was teaching. They were all enthusiastic about Jesus and liked to be around Jesus. But they're not turning to Jesus in repentance and belief. They are all curious, but they are not converted. If Jesus continues to preach the gospel of God, he to the people. As Jesus is preaching verse 14, he says that he saw Levi, the son of Atheus, sitting on the tax book, and he said to him, Follow me. And Levi rose and followed him. Not just to give us some cultural context, but tax collectors were some of the most hated and despised people in Jesus' day. Tax collectors were Jews who collected taxes, taxes from other Jews in order to give to the Roman government to pay for their wars and their expensive infrastructure. Jews wanted out from under the Roman oppression. They didn't want to be financially supporting it, so tax collectors were often viewed as traitors in the eyes of the people. Because if you work for the Romans, you are working for the enemy. Now that sounds pretty bad, here is how they would collect taxes. The Roman government would require a certain amount of money to be collected from the people. But the tax collector could ask for whatever he wanted on top of that in order to pocket himself. This meant the tax collectors couldn't be trusted. They were crooks who were known for their dishonesty and extortion. And as a result, they were total social outcasts. They couldn't get any lower in society than a tax collector. This was not the kind of person that would you invite to a dinner party. What is astounding and astonishing is that Jesus called this man to follow him. Out of everyone in that crowd that Jesus could have called, he sees Levi, the tax collector. This is a scandal of race, and you see it happen all throughout the Gospels. Jesus calling people to follow, regardless of their reputation or their status in society. Jesus doesn't call people based on their performance, he calls them based on his goodness and mercy. We look at the response of Levi. It says in the passage that he rose and followed Jesus. Notice how risky this would have been for Levi. This is now the second time that Jesus individually called people to follow him. The first instance being the fourth vision. What makes this call to follow Jesus more risky for Levi? and for the four fishermen of the Gospels, is that unlike the fishermen, Levi has nothing to go back to if he follows Jesus. The fishermen can go back to their nets, but Levi can't go back to collecting the taxes. There is, therefore, a cost for Levi to follow Jesus. But just as quickly as Jesus calls him, Levi responds by following him. And further, Levi has gathered together all his tax collecting friends and other people who were the jam upon society, and they are eating with Jesus and his son. Now, how amazing is it that Jesus can be the common denominator of that group of people? That the fishermen who have been following Jesus for a little while, and many others who follow Jesus, all in the same room as the tax collector, so called sinner. 
there would have been no reason for this group of people to be in the same room together other than they were all there because of Jesus. He is what binds them together. It's a scandal of grace. We can be a Christian 60 years, or we can be a Christian for 60 minutes, and we can be on the same level because of Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus is trying to accomplish. But later in the scripture, we read verse 16. The scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was easy to sin as a tax collector, said to his disciples, why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Now, do you notice that the religious, religious leaders don't ask their questions to Jesus, but to his disciples? The tax collectors and sinners invite Jesus to dinner, but the scribes who are on the outside of the inn have judgment and can't even ask Jesus himself about why he does it. Now, maybe the religious leaders are upset with Jesus because he's eating with a lonely group of tax collectors and sinners instead of eating with them. Maybe they're jealous, but I think it's even more sinister than that. You see, the scribes aren't upset with Jesus because they want Jesus, but because they don't want this other group to have any contact with Jesus. They don't want this other group to receive the good news about Jesus. See, the religious leaders have become very good at separating themselves from sinners. They could have managed that Jesus, the Son of God, the one who proclaimed to be the Messiah, could be comfortable with this sinners. But here, Jesus is illustrating the radical nature of Christ. We would expect Jesus to be eating with the normally superior, but instead he's eating with the moral and bankrupt. They're the ones who get Jesus. The religious leaders can't understand this. So their response is to say that tax collectors and sinners don't deserve Jesus, don't deserve grace. And they're right, they don't deserve it. But they also never could understand the gospel of Jesus and it's based on whatever or not we are deserving. If that were the case, grace would cease to be grace. The point of grace is that we don't deserve it. It's why we don't see Jesus telling you before he will leave. He doesn't make repentance a prerequisite of his love and acceptance. Father Jesus loves and accepts acts of collectors and sinners as they are. And if they forsake their evil and amend their lives, they do so not in order to gain Jesus' faith, but because Jesus has shown me his undeserved faith. <coughs> That's all of us. We are naturally sick of sin. And Jesus isn't saying here that there are some people who need a doctor and there are some people who don't. We all need a doctor. We all need outside help from the great physician. Jesus' point here is that only ones who come to the great physician are the ones who realise that they need outside help to help. Jesus then says in the scriptures, Something really interesting that fleshes out even more. He says, I am came not to call the righteous by sinners. This doesn't mean there are two categories of people in the world. There's the righteous and there's the sinners. And that only the sinners need to be saved. We know that all of us are sinners fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is saying there are those who see no need for Saviour from their sins, and there are those who do. But the only ones who are going to be called by Jesus and saved by their sins are the ones who realise that they need outside for a that Saviour. Loving Father, thank you for the privilege of partnering with you and each other in the work that you have
We know that the police our efforts and contributions for the proclamation of the gospel and building up the church here in Perry. And reverence for your people in this great land under the Son of the Cross. And we value our former and glory, and above all, we learn to value each other. May we experience the humanness of the day and reach that in friendship and peace. May we learn to think of ourselves in friendship and the past and work towards a nation well for all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Please uh, say the traditional prayer or pray the Lord's Prayer you know your own name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today and give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from you. For the kingdom, power, uh, and the glory of our lives. Now Before we conclude today, uh, just want to acknowledge um, Australia in two days' time. In your handout today, your Lord of Service, I took the liberty of bringing up two very relevant and ideal pieces. One uh, famous poem, and secondly, the words of my Australian. Josh played during the handwriting music, uh, written by Bruce Woodley in the scenes. Uh, I think I've told you in the past that I uh, had fortune to uh, live in the same building as the future government for uh, years. The second time I moved out of home and took my independence, I moved into the friend I worked with, and uh, we were moving in the Sunday. My dad and brothers came up to me and said, Do you know who's on the first floor? And I said, I've got no idea. And they said, Julia Curran, she's just come out to greet us. So, for two and a half years, I lived with our brother and Tom in Murphy Street in South Carolina. She's an amazing person. No, Bruce, Bruce will be another friend of Moses, but um, she has rewritten another, another version which has more. Meaning for our first nation. Um, later in life, I, I um, was living in summer because I opened my tent for a A friend of mine was the local real estate agent, John Dunlop, and uh, his best friend was Apple and I. So I got to meet Apple and um, we had two businesses. Uh, we used to spot some of the best lights, Christmas lights, in summer. And we used to have Apple judge those best lights as Christmas, and uh, he got to know him too. He was a great person as well. Personally, I'm a youth generation Australian, a both person, um, my mother's side, 
and from Australia, the free chip, 1838, 1840. My father's side came from the centre. I attended the COVID study. And um, I think we had 42 in most of my classes uh, because COVID was an area of migrants. Came first to the living, we had Greeks, Italians, Turks. Uh, we had uh, quite a number of uh, Aboriginal children at our school because located in Kodak was an area where the government provided housing for Aboriginal people. So I'm glad I had that opportunity. I was looking in the inbox of the government to remind you today of. Being Australian. I'll just walk away from some of you a little bit so I might get struck down by a lot of the calm stories in the Bible talk about Israel and Israelites and Moses bring the chosen people to the land of the But maybe I certainly feel that we have a great responsibility. So I think we need ourselves today the land that we're coming to. And there are times that maybe we need as a nation to bind together and not be seen as separated from the So I think we need today coming forward to work for a community, not just for that person, but with migrant people who have come here to start a second life. We have a very diverse congregation. Um, See the Samoans, Sierra Leone, but our older members of the congregation also be migrants. David over there, his family came from Norway. John's family came from northern Prussia, I think not June. Others from England. But adversity is strong, and I think we have the best bedrock to become a nation among the nations. So I've said it. So, would you please stand for May you always stand tall as a tree. Be strong as a rock in the world. As gentle and still as the morning is. Hold the warmth of the campfire in your heart. May the creative spirit always walk with you. Our final view is 755. Thank <laughs> you. 